Good afternoon, everyone across the nation and as far afield as Jaipur in India, Hong Kong and South Africa. I'd like to thank each of you for taking the time today to join us at 25 Bedford Row in this further webinar in our ongoing series, Trial by Jury on Death Row. The title may be hard hitting, but so too have government suggestions. For those of us who share a deep rooted and immovable passion for criminal justice, as I know all of you do, possible inroads to the jury system are unacceptable. It is as simple as that. The discussion, however, is more complex. In seeking to grapple with relative paralysis within the criminal justice process, recent ministerial proposals have included the possibility of suspension of jury trial to be substituted by judge only, alternatively judge and two magistrates by way of trial forum. The suggestion of reducing jury numbers has also been canvassed. These proposals have come in different shapes and sizes with various possible limitations. It may be that some or all have been seen off temporarily, but that does not mean the end of these suggestions. We know from experience that that is the position. And this afternoon is aimed at identifying and particularizing the panoply of reasons for protection of the jury system, the lifeblood of the criminal justice process. We are extremely fortunate to welcome four illustrious panelists, experts in their field, each of whom will speak on the topic of jury trial and the essential need for its preservation from a particular angle. Let me introduce our four panelists. First, Paul Mendel QC, well known, I'm sure, to many or most of you. One of my joint heads at 25 Bedford Row. Paul has been practicing at the criminal bar since 1983. He is a former chairman of the Criminal Bar Association and is in prime position as a vastly experienced and supremely well-respected jury advocate to speak on the topic of juries. Our second panelist is Professor Luke Marsh, who is joining us from the Chinese University of Hong Kong, where it is shortly after midnight at present. Luke is Associate Professor at the Faculty of Law, Chinese University of Hong Kong, and a door tenant at 25 Bedford Row. And his research interest covers the field of criminal law and procedural justice, with a particular interest in examining the erosion of the adversarial process in England and Wales. And Luke's book, together with Mike McConville, um, just published, is called The Myth of Judicial Independence, Criminal Justice and the Separation of Power, recently published by Oxford University Press, exploring the role played by the British government and senior judges in the regulation of policing at home and across the Commonwealth in modern times. Professor Cheryl Thomas QC is the country's leading expert on juries and judges as director of the University College London Jury Project and the UCL Judicial Institute. Cheryl has been conducting empirical research with actual juries at the Crown Court in England and Wales for over 15 years. And she will discuss her research and her uh, experiences in the course of her presentation. And last but not least is um, Sushil Kumar, who is a very well respected junior at 25 Bedford Row and a first tier tribunal judge with a great deal of experience in the Crown Court and the Magistrates Court. Uh, and he will be drawing from that experience in addressing us. 
Each of the panelists will speak for up to a maximum of 10 minutes. Please feel free to um, deposit questions on the question answer um, aspect. Um, uh, and I may ask some of them in between speakers or, or at the end. Um, and finally, before I invite Paul to commence, uh, we're going to add in something which I hope will uh, be of real interest. In a moment, a poll question is going to be put up on the screen. I'd ask you all to vote on the question. Um, we will not be disclosing the response, or the answer, um, as to what the poll revealed. But I'll be posing the question again before we end, just before 6.15, and announcing both results, the before and the after, and the after at the same time. So with Varuna's help, if we could put up the poll question at this point in time, please. If inroads to the jury system could guarantee a material speeding up in the listing of custody cases, would you be in favour? If, if you could all vote on that question now, um, as I say, that the response will be revealed at the end. And if Runa could take that down when the poll is complete, we'll move on. I, I'm, unless I'm told otherwise, I'm going to end the poll at this point. Thank you all for voting on that. And with that introduction, I'd now like to hand you over to Paul Mendel, QC. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Jeremy, and uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, I'm sure that uh, you all remember your first jury trial. I now I remember mine. It was at Snaresbrook Crown Court, where the defendant was charged with shoplifting a bottle of alcohol. And although it's over 35 years ago, I can't all I managed to blurt out was, there's a conflict of evidence, it's a matter for you. The defendant was duly convicted, but I, I didn't feel too bad because I was prosecuting. You'll not be surprised to learn that that was my shortest ever speech. And although I have many times since wished I could always be that brief and that successful, The juries I've appeared in front of since then, I suppose it must run into a few hundred. None this year, of course. Mostly in London, but occasionally farther afield, in other big cities and in towns. Juries in most, but not all, London courts and in big cities tend to be more ethnically diverse than juries in the sticks. But my experience is that all juries, no matter what their gender, ethnic or cultural composition, take their duties seriously and do their job. I had a very middle-class South Coast jury that must have led a very sheltered life because in a drugs case where the defense was the police had planted the drugs in about two dozen different and increasingly unlikely spots throughout the caravan, the only note they sent was in retirement and it read, has it ever been known for the police to plant drugs? Well, through gritted teeth, the judge gave the only answer he could and acquittal duly followed. So I have no special insights into jury trial beyond the limited one gained by appearing in front of juries for over three decades. This is a mere practitioner's experience of jury trial. And because I've never sat on a jury, it's necessarily the view from the outside. So its inner workings are a mystery to me, as indeed are many of its external signs. I've had a jury laughing loudly shortly before they came into court to deliver the verdict of guilty. I've had jurors crying when they've acquitted a defendant of nothing more emotional than a cannabis charge. I've had jury notes so off beam that they might as well have been listening to a different case. I've had a jury send over 200 notes in a three week trial, all of them on point. So the jury system covers all these extremes and plenty more. I know that the plural of anecdotes is not data, and one man's impression of how and why the jury system works is of little weight. But it is not without value that the views I express 
are probably shared by the vast majority of criminal practitioners, both prosecution and defense. And my view is that the system works. It's not infallible. No human system is, but it seems to get it right most of the time. There have been very many cases where I have thought a defendant has received a fortunate acquittal, but that's a consequence of the burden and standard of proof, not a criticism of the jury system. That's what to expect when the system works properly. There must be good and bad jurors, and the merit of having 12 is that the bad ones are outweighed by the good. But I have almost never come across a bad jury. Tough juries, yes, plenty. Ones that didn't return the verdicts I wanted, far too many. But juries that got it wrong and convicted an innocent man, in both cases, uh, in my whole career, I can only remember two occasions when I thought the jury got it wrong and convicted an innocent man. And in both cases, I can honestly say that different defense teams might well have got different verdicts. It has its flaws, which system does not. Some argue it's flawed because unlike judges, a jury does not give reasons for its decisions. In fact, nowadays with written directions and routes to verdicts, it's often easy to see how the jury has arrived at its verdicts. But its merit far outweigh its flaws. And I want to highlight just three of them. Its legitimacy, its independence, and its fairness. Legitimacy. A jury's verdict is judgment by your peers and it gains legitimacy from that fact alone. We know that defendants are much more likely to accept an adverse verdict when it's a judgment of men and women who look, think and talk like them rather than some remote figure or figures on a bench. That's a benefit for the defendant. But there are wider societal benefits. Witnesses too know that their evidence has to be submitted to and understood and assessed by members of the public. And every working day, large sections of the general public have direct first-hand experience of the criminal justice system to counterbalance and correct the false impression they might have gathered from press, TV, and social media. There is no other organ of state that as a fundamental part of its procedure invites the general public right into the very heart of its decision-making process in this way. In 2013, Dominic Grieve, a former Attorney General said, it seems to me that one way for the system to maintain legitimacy is for people to have a way of genuinely being part of the decision-making process. Indeed, it's hard to think of a more serious or important civil duty that virtually any member of the public may be called upon to conduct. Secondly, independence. Juries have long exercised what is called jury equity, the right of the jury to acquit, even in the teeth of evidence of guilt. They've always done so to mitigate the punishments of overharsh laws. They did it so frequently in the 18th and 19th century that many capital statutes were virtually suspended. And of course, as Bushell's case reminds us from over 350 years ago, juries can bring in perverse acquittals entirely against the weight of the evidence, something no professional decision-making tribunal could do nor one that was obliged to give reasons for its decisions. In 1985, Clive Ponting was perversely acquitted of breaching the Official Secrets Act by leaking details of the sinking of the Belgrano. And in 91, Randall and Pottle were tried for helping the double agent George Blake escape from Wormwood Scrubs. The judge ruled they had no defense in law, but the jury still unanimously acquitted them. And that, in a nutshell, is why trial by judge alone or with others will always be an unsatisfactory alternative because no judge can ignore the law. But those exceptional cases do not exhaust what I mean by the independence of the jury. I mean independence of mind, independence of thought, unafraid to come to what they believe is the right decision, despite what judge and counsel may say. They are independent of judicial opinion and dare I say it, of loyally eloquence and wiles. I believe that juries do listen to the evidence and do decide cases on the evidence and are remarkably proof against judicial prejudice and the rhetorical flourishes of silver tongue counsel, no matter how great a blow that may be to our self-esteem. And fairness. Juries nowadays are much more representative of the communities and general population than they used to be. 
the upper age limit for jurors has been raised twice from 65 to 70 and then to 75. Indeed, in long cases, it's the middle classes who are more able to avoid sitting because they have holidays booked or are vital to their businesses. The jibe is we end up with juries of students, the unemployed and the retired. But so what? Who says fairness and an ability to listen to the evidence are limited to the well-off and the employed? A jury verdict is the judgment of 12 amateurs who are not case hardened, who are not going to reject a defense of innocent association or lack of knowledge or fit up or self-defense because they've heard it so many times before. They come to each case fresh with fresh eyes and judge it on its merits by using their common sense and experience. So juries are above all fair. And of course, in a criminal justice system that is systemically skewed against black, Asian and minority ethnic defendants at every stage from stop and search onwards, the jury is the one place where the system is at its least racist, the one part of the system that can and does redress the balance. So finally, 35 years of jury trials has made me more of a fan of the jury system, not less. It has its faults, but whatever its faults, my view is it has fewer than other systems. It might be said of jury trial, that rather like democracy, it's the worst system apart from every other one that's been tried. I finished, Jeremy. I'm sorry. Um, I, you seem you don't. You seem to be looking for something further. Thank you ever so much for that, Paul. Can I ask you this before we move on? And I hope you'll forgive me, but it is in fact the poll question. If inroads to the jury system could guarantee a material speeding up in the list uh, listing of custody cases, would you, would you be in favour? Um, ab absolutely not. Um... It, it seems to me that sooner or later every government gets the jury in its sights and there's always a reason for that. Uh, sometimes it's the costs. A few years ago it was the costs in 2012. The then uh, coalition government was banging on about the costs. Sometimes it's delays, sometimes it's backlogs. Right now it's the backlog. Uh, there's always an excuse because governments simply don't like juries. There are lots of ways to deal with a backlog. They can open other court buildings. They can start sitting on days when they don't sit. They can start using the services of all the uh, recorders, part-time judges that they haven't been using to date. They can open up the purse strings and show some willpower to get through the backlog. This backlog existed before COVID. It's been exacerbated by COVID, but it's, it's not caused by COVID. And I absolutely and, and completely oppose to any measures to speed up the processing of the backlog. Thank you very much indeed. Um, your response could be clearer. And can I remind everyone that if you want to place questions um, on the question answer um, uh, aspect that you're very welcome to do so as we go along. Can I now, um, following from Paul, um, invite our next panellist to speak, Professor Luke Marsh. Uh, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, let me uh, thank the organisers of this uh, event, not least uh, Verena Askelon and uh, Emma Makepeace for uh, extending the invitation to speak on what appears to be um, an ongoing governmental and judicial ambition uh, to shift away from the jury as an adjudicatory body. And so in the time that I have, um, I'd like to touch upon uh, two uh, central issues as I see it. And the first is really to reflect upon why we continue to use juries uh, when so many other features of the criminal justice landscape uh, have fallen out of fashion. And the second is to, to ask why the modern role judges play under the criminal procedure rules amplifies risks to fairness which are in fact already inherent uh, to judge only trials. So as part of thinking about that first question, I think it's useful to ask uh, to what extent are judges a suitable replacement uh, for juries in terms of their uh, fact-finding role? But to really answer the question, uh, we have to remind ourselves 
what the value of a jury is beyond their fact-finding uh, function. Now, as to uh, whether judges are suitable for a role which demands uh, total objectivity, the initial test of that uh, is their historic performance. The test of that uh, would be uh, their handling of the Birmingham Six uh, or the Boar's Water Farm case. Uh, it would be cases where fact-finding is most important and where they are found to be most efficient. But what I would say is you cannot, in the abstract, say judges cannot find facts. Now, of course, a good judge uh, may be able to ascertain uh, facts in a straightforward case, but the reason you have a jury is, first of all, that it is not simply a fact-finding body. It is also there to judge uh, the law, and so it really does uh, two things. And if it finds, uh, for example, that uh, a prosecution uh, is one which was oppressive, or the law is one which no reasonable person could accept, then it is entitled under the jury of the constitution, uh, sorry, under the constitution of the jury to, to acquit. Uh, and that's even in cases where the defendant admits that they did it. So there is no dispute about facts in that type of case. And we've also heard from uh, Paul Mendel on the Clive Ponting case. There's no dispute about the facts uh, where a civil servant uh, leaked confidential uh, documents and said, yes, uh, it, it was me, but there was good reason uh, to, because the government was misleading parliament uh, on the, the sinking of, of the Belgrano during the Falklands uh, War. And the public ought to know about it. Now the jury agreed with that and they rejected the assertion by the trial judge that the interest of the government and the state were identical. So it depends upon what you think the role of a trial is and I would say that it, it is an adjudicatory body but an adjudicatory body is not simply about uh, fact-finding it's also there to judge uh, the law and the applicability of uh, the prosecution. Now whatever the background of a judge the judge by oath of office is required to apply the law. They cannot uh, waver on that. And so they, they have two quite different traditions which underpin the justifications for their position. Juries have much greater freedom. Uh, judges um, have none. But that's quite different, I think, in terms of fact-finding. So there we are talking about not only intellectual ability, but trust, and about being able to fairly find facts in a situation where they are contemporaneously uh, being required to push or, or process uh, cases um, as efficiently as possible. And that leads me on to my, my second main point, uh, the modern role um, of the judge. Because it is quite easy for us to glide over this notion that judges should be uh, managers. If you think back, uh, these once upon a time neutral referees were in fact reconstructed uh, to be managers by the criminal procedure rules uh, and its, its overriding objective to deal with cases as efficiently and as expeditiously as possible. So managers under this structure are required to move cases forward quickly, and they're required to do that, notwithstanding um, that they are not under pressure from oppressive uh, case numbers. They still have to move the case on. So what I would say is, you tell me 
how you, in those circumstances, marry on the one hand this uh, need to look after the, the state interest by moving cases expeditiously uh, forward, and second, uh, finding facts dispassionately and um, objectively. And I, I would say to you that they are contradictory requirements, irrespective of that other issue that I uh, have advanced, which is what is the role of an adjudicatory body. So there are two separate issues here. The first is the, the purely instrumental one of being told to get rid of cases as quickly uh, as possible, and at the same time, to try those residual cases fairly. And those residual cases will include those that the judge has failed to get rid of quickly uh, that they think should have been guilty pleas. So they're, they're confronted uh, with what they might see as failures of the system. And you can then see that there is the danger of them converting that failure into a success um, at trial. And you only have to think what you might do in that position, where you get a case and the judge makes it quite clear uh, that they think the defendant should plead uh, guilty right now. But suppose your client, or suppose the defendant uh, objects and wants to go to trial. And then of course, um, there is no jury. The judge, of course, would have already uh, made up their mind. Now, allied to that point, if you are going to have trials without a jury, then all that will happen is that you will have a judge who will say, I've read the papers, counsel. Uh, you don't need to go through that. You don't need to explain things to me like you do a jury. Um, what's your uh, main point? And so it is a very different um, enterprise. And of course, a judge has a power to cross-examine witnesses in a way that the jury does not. And we know that the problem there is that is where judicial bias may come out. And it's not simply those miscarriage uh, of justice cases I, I alluded to. We see it in cases today where the, the judge enters the arena and the whole thing becomes inquisitorial. So ultimately, it's about mindset and whether and to what extent you can have objectivity and fairness in such a situation. Now, what I would say is that, of course, it is possible, but it is equally possible. In fact, it is more likely that a judge's case manager status will get in the way of that objectivity. So juries are there to guard against the risk of bias. That's a key reason why uh, you need a jury and why I object to their removal on any grounds, not least the backlog. Thank you very much, Luke. That was crystal clear. Question has come up from Lisa Wilson, who is a member of Chambers, um, which reads as follows. You appear trenchant on the need for a jury system, but juries are not infallible. Wouldn't a positive outcome of COVID-19 be a rethink on how criminal cases are deliberated upon, especially if better solutions will also help us to tackle that other crisis we face, the backlog? Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll build upon uh, Paul's answer a little um, by starting off and saying that I think that there is a, a danger here, of course, of using COVID-19 as, as a pretext for major constitutional change uh, taking place rapidly. The other danger uh, that I would like to, to highlight that, that touches upon what Paul was referring to was that the backlog, of course, uh, existed prior to COVID-19's uh, emergence. And there's a danger, of course, of conflating that backlog uh, with the build-up, the inevitable build-up that occurred when the courts uh, were closed. 
But if you actually look at the numbers, there, there were some 38,000 or so, I believe, cases listed, jury cases listed um, at the end of last year. And that number rose, but it only rose by less than 10% um, to about 41,000 uh, at the end of, of May. And in fact, um, the backlog has even been has been even larger in the past. So what I would say is that I reject this, this argument, or I challenge the idea that the COVID-19 backlog uh, somehow justifies uh, these reforms. And, and just to sort of to finish, I would say that you can't, you can't sever this issue uh, from the historic austerity program, which has seen cuts to uh, the courts, to legal aid, to, to the CPS, and of course, uh, to the police. Now, if one wants to look for traceable causes uh, for this backlog, uh, you need to look no uh, further. And the fact is, um, this has been a, a product over many years of underfunding uh, every part of the institutions. And I'll just end briefly by saying, if, if there is to be change to the, the tradition of the common law, if there is to be change to the arrangements of jury trials, then there must be um, a lengthy, a, a detailed and in-depth study uh, to take place rather than reliance on some spurious logic of necessity. Thank, thank you very much. And, and thanks also to Lisa for that um, incisive question. Paul, who has a great deal of experience of these things, has um, observed that the backlog was over 55,000 in 2014, 2015. Um, all right, so it's now time to move on to our third panelist. There are a number of questions uh, and the questions are mounting up. We'll, 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 we'll come to as many as we can in the final 35 minutes, but I'm absolutely delighted to welcome uh, Professor Cheryl Thomas as our next speaker. Thank you, Jeremy, um, and thank you uh, to 25 Bedford Row for inviting me to take part in, in this discussion. Um, I think in the context of Luke's concern about uh, judicial decision making, I think it's important to remember that trial in the Crown Court is trial by judge and jury. And, it, and in my research, I find that uh, those judge, judges that sit with juries are actually some of the strongest supporters of juries and the fairness of the jury system. And the research supports this view. So I'd like to highlight uh, in the short time I have uh, what empirical research tells us about the jury system here and the consequences of some of the current proposals to remove or alter trial by jury. So I've been doing research about and with real juries at court for almost 20 years. Um, I see juries post-verdict at court, and I also analyze all jury verdicts in uh, all Crown Courts in England and Wales over quite a period of time. So I'd like to share with you uh, three main headlines from uh, this quite uh, long body of research. The first is that juries are efficient. Once they're sworn, they're very rarely discharged, that's 1% of cases, and they almost always go on to deliberate, they're rarely directed to reach a verdict by the judge. Second, juries are effective. Once juries go into deliberation, they reach a verdict 99% of the time. Hung juries are extremely rare in this jurisdiction. So I think we can say that if you give juries a job to do, they do it. Uh, third, and really most importantly, the research has found that juries are fair. So all the empirical evidence shows that juries in this jurisdiction reach verdicts based on the evidence and the law. There isn't, for instance, a postcode lottery for jury trials where verdicts by juries in different parts of the country are significantly different for similar offenses. And crucially, the research has shown that the one stage in the criminal justice process where members of black and minority ethnic groups are not disproportionately treated is when a jury reaches a verdict. We found that there are no significant differences in jury conviction rates across all offense categories for both white and BAME defendants. 
this finding is based on an analysis of every single jury verdict in England and Wales over a 10 year period. I conducted this analysis for the Lamy Review, and I don't think anyone should really underestimate the significance of that finding. In the context of Black Lives Matter movement, I think it's actually quite shocking that we should be talking about removing trial by jury, which is so far the only part of the criminal justice process that has empirically been shown not to discriminate against minority ethnic groups. So if, you know, so juries we found are effective, efficient and fair. Uh, what is not effective, efficient or fair is the selling off and the running down of the Crown Court estate and the forced non-sitting of judges in the Crown Court. Propo proposals to remove trial by jury are also not going to solve the existing backlog of cases in the Crown Court because it is extremely unlikely that any of the 40,000 plus cases currently in the backlog could be tried without a jury. The proposals would only relate to subsequent jury trials. So I'd like to look now at some of the other proposals that are also circulating around, which will fundamentally alter trial by jury in this jurisdiction. And I'll highlight what research tells us is wrong with these proposals. The first is uh, the proposal to reduce the size of juries. So there's serious discussion about reducing the size of juries here to as few as six or seven jurors. And there are no, numerous studies across a range of different jurisdictions that highlight the benefits of decision making by groups of 12. That group, it's been found, is large enough to allow a wide range of views, yet small enough to be effective. In the US, some states uh, allow juries as small as six. And there are evident problems with this. First, there cannot safely be majority verdicts with su such small juries. And the problems with requiring unanimous verdicts in all cases is well studied. Um, they allow a single juror to prevent a verdict. They lead to increases in hung juries and even open up juries to a much greater risk of jury tampering. There have also been uh, proposals for virtual juries where jurors sit at home and, uh, and, and, kind of, and oh, well, basically jury by Zoom. Um, the organization Justice, uh, their attempt at a mock jury trial online during lockdown was, an, was really an admirable exercise, but the list of problems with uh, jury by Zoom is extensive. And in terms of fairness and justice, I would say that they're insurmountable. Because so if you think about it, who could be a juror in such a case? Uh, really only those who have the proper equipment, good and reliable internet access, a separate room in their home that's off limits to everyone else from nine to four every weekday. Um, how many people have this? And what will this do to the representative nature of juries? Uh, detailed research with real juries at court in England and Wales over the last 20 years has consistently shown that the current system of random selection from the electoral list with no excusals as of right produces remarkably representative pools of people at each Crown Court, and that juries selected from these pools show virtually no systematic bias against defendants based on ethnicity, age, gender, or region. So why would we want to tamper with this system of eligibility? There have also been suggestions of having virtual juries who sit together, but not in court, and they're beamed into the court from a, a remote location. What's flawed with this approach is that it fails to understand what's so important for jurors about be physically being present in court. Um, I think the Lord Chief Justice uh, was right when he said that if a jury trial is going to happen, the two groups that must physically be in court are the jury and the judge. And I want to share some findings I've not yet published um, with you from some very recent research with actual juries at court uh, that we did before the lockdown. We asked them about their attitude to jury service, both, both before they attended court and when they were leaving after they returned a verdict. Um, of those jurors, 87% of these jurors said that when they were first summoned, if jury service had been voluntary, they would not have done it. But having done jury service, almost all of these jurors said the experience of being in court for the trial was interesting, 
it was informative, and it was educational. And as a result, 81% of these jurors, as they were leaving court, said they would now be happy to serve again if they were summoned. So the experience of being, court, being in court is clearly transformational for most members of the public. And I think we shouldn't underestimate the wider civic benefits of jury service. Uh, and to illustrate this, I'd like to end by sharing one final piece of research that I think is one of the best pieces of empirical research on juries, and I hasten to, to say that it's not mine. Um, a long-term study in, in the United States has found that people who served on a jury and had never voted before were significantly more likely to vote at the next election. They also found that jury service sparked long-term shifts in how people use the media and their involvement in community and civic groups. So the consequences of removing or altering trial by jury are profound because the consequences of doing jury service are also so profound for fairness in the criminal justice system and for democracy. Thank you very much indeed, Cheryl. And um, there, are, there are an escalating number of questions, um, frankly, equally apportioned to the panelists that have spoken so far. But if I could just ask you, Cheryl, at this point in time, um, Ibrahim Ilias has asked, does the lay element that magistrates would bring to a one judge, two magistrate bench coupled with the temporary nature of such a measure not justify its imposition. What's your view on that? Yeah, it's, it's a, a very good and important question. Um, I, I think we should not uh, draw the same connection between lay magistrates and jurors. Lay magistrates choose to be magistrates. They put themselves forward. Um, and I think what is, is actually remarkable about the recent research that, that I just shared with you, um, it, with the jurors here, is that uh, if jury service was voluntary, you'd only have a tiny proportion of people putting themselves forward. And in fact, it's, it's the fact that it's not voluntary and that people are required to do jury service and it's representative. And that's what we find produces the fair the fairness of jury verdicts. So I think we have to be very careful to suggest that lay magistrates equate to jurors. They, they simply don't. It's simply in the nature of who they are, their background, and how they come to be lay magistrates. All right. Thank, thank you for that. And perhaps um, before we come to Sushil, Paul, I can ask you a question that um, has been posed by Brandon Ashford which uh, relates to the question of hung juries. Does the opportunity to professionalize the decision-making through legal professional, i.e. several magistrates or judges, decide on guilt, assist in pre preventing a hung jury? Um, I mean, I put the question in the form that, that it's been asked. What's your observation on that? Well, I think in fact, <clears throat> Cheryl has already answered this. This is a very, very small proportion of what happens in jury trials. Um, I think 1% was the figure that um, Cheryl gave. Um, so we're dealing with a virtually non-existent problem and the solution to the non-existent problem would be far worse than the problem itself. Um, so I don't see that as a reason. Um, we've all got experience as criminal advocates of hung juries. Um, they very, very often get resolved at a second trial. It's extraordinarily rare that they go to a third trial. Um, and so I, I, I don't see this as a problem and certainly not a problem that requires um, ditching the jury in favor of magistrates. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you for those questions so far. There are a number still to be posed if we have time. Uh, we're doing well on time. Congratulations to all the panelists so far for keeping within their 10 minutes. That puts particular pressure on Sushil not to become uh, the exception to that rule and um, very happy to invite Sushil now to speak to us. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. I'm always very happy to be an outlier. Um, if I may, I, I want to start by painting some background um, to the current discussions 
And I'd like to do that by talking about principles, principles such as access to justice, the right to representation, and the right to a jury trial, which run through the bedrock of our democracy and provide the basis for the rule of law. Uh, we have in recent times seen a sustained assault on all of these, and the attack on trial by jury is merely the latest in a long line of these assaults. Uh, you may remember between 2013 and 2017, a system which was administered, which restricted access to justice by the payment of prohibitively expensive fees to lodge claims at employment tribunals. Uh, this resulted in a reduction of some 75% of cases before in 2017 the Supreme Court found this to be unlawful, with Lord Reid enunciating the principle of access to justice in, in stark terms. Uh, without such access, laws are liable to become dead letter, the work done by Parliament may be rendered nugatory, and the democratic election of members of Parliament may become a meaningless charade. You will also, of course, be aware of a number of non-imprisonable offences, which are amongst those which you are denied access to legal aid for. These may result in the loss of your good character, the loss of your ability to earn a living, the potential loss of your right to work in the sector of your choice. They carry lasting financial and emotional and mental damage. So against this background, what's incredibly important is to underline the real value and virtue of jury trials, which has been so eloquently done by those other speakers before me. I won't attempt to do so in the same fashion, but what I want to do is take directly from the Blackstone Lecture of 2017 delivered by Lady Justice Hallett, who recited a pantheon of legal figures on their views of trial by jury. Uh, for William Blackstone, it was the sacred bulwark of the nation. Uh, for Lord Camden, it was the foundation of our free constitution. And for Lord Eldon, it was the greatest blessing which the British Constitution had secured to the subject. Now, more recently, Lord Judge called it a safeguard against oppression and dictatorship. And what is worth repeating and bears repetition on numerous occasions is the current response that we have had, both by the Lord Chancellor uh, and what the Lord Chief Justice said. The Lord Chancellor saying, in relation to the denial of jury trials for certain either way offences, he stated a 40% increase in capacity is one I couldn't ignore. The Lord Chief Justice stated that it was a possibility that I believe is worthy of consideration by policymakers. This falls, you may think, a very long way short of the extolling of the virtues of jury trial that we all know is so valuable and so important. The, the three points from the Justice Committee meeting of 23rd of June that I wish to address are, are first of all, the plans by the Lord Chancellor are not fully formed, suggesting that a judge and two magistrates could sit in place of a jury for either way offences. And this wasn't merely limited to cases such as those seeing a two year maximum sentence. It was mooted by the Lord Chancellor, as it was mentioned amongst a number of other possibilities that he had in hand. Uh, that means, essentially, that either way cases such as fraud, causing death by careless driving, sexual assault of a child under 13, may have the right to jury trial restricted. If, if the two-year maximum sentence rule was imposed, that would still include serious offences, such as dangerous driving, voyeurism, racially aggravated assault. So the, the myth of the lesser offence being dealt with as an either way matter by a judge and two magistrates is a pernicious one. Secondly, the tacit acceptance of key findings of the Lamy review on race within the criminal justice system speak incredibly strongly as to the importance of a jury trial. 
And that's something that Professor Thomas has underlined most powerfully. And the Lord Chancellor accepted that it was right to mention that the jury system was an exception within the criminal justice system, which did not have an institutional bias. And lastly, the notion that this measure of the restriction of right to jury trial would be sunsetted. It would be temporary, and not on the basis of permanent change. But that, of course, is a political decision and a guarantee that is likely best judged by the past conduct of governments. But why does it matter in this context? And it's the issue of jury fairness that's so important. The randomly selected group of 12 people from an electoral roll with a diversity of colour, ethnicity, sex, sexuality, creed, political view, life experience and schooling and class. That is what they bring. A vehicle of justice that the Lamy Review writes, on average and in general, applies the law impartially, without prejudice or favour across ethnicity, and where conviction rates are similar across cases, where even where BAME defendants are being tried by all white juries. So in replacing such a jury with three finders of fact, two of whom are from the magistrate's court, one must be aware that those in the magistrate's court are from a self-selecting constituency where 5% of their number are under 40, where 52% of their number are over 60, and who are drawn from a pool of people with the sufficient confidence, financial resources, and interest to pass judgment on others. What may also be of concern is analysis within the Lamy Review again, and accepting the lacuna in the data, analyzing plea and representation. But when one looks at outcomes for, for example, black and minority ethnic women as against white women, for every 100 white women found guilty of an offence in the magistrate's court, 122 black women were found guilty, 142 Asian women were found guilty, and 143 Chinese or classified as other women were found guilty. It would be fantasy to suggest that the recitation of such statistics would not only be entirely proper in assisting defendants in choosing how they would like to be tried, but also highlighting it as a matter of the gravest concern. And finally, I, I need not dwell upon the issue of the final fact finder. Again, amongst those judges and recorders, circuit judges that is, whose ethnicity is known, 3% of those sitting on the circuit bench are BAME. Not quite 2% are under 40, but almost half are over 60. And when examining the bailiwick of these professional decision makers, again, the Lamy Review reveals that within sentencing for BAME offenders in drugs, the odds of receiving a prison sentence was around 240% higher than when compared with their white counterparts. Again, there are gaps in the data. But these percentages reveal very serious concerns as to unconscious bias that there may be present where that is not the case within the jury system. I, I would like to move on and also consider the issue of those, briefly, who are not uh, in BAME categories, but who form a significant percentage of people who may find themselves in front of the court system. Consider those who are in the most disadvantaged, financially disadvantaged category of society. And I take the following figures from the Judicial College's Equal Treatment Bench Book. 18 million people in this country who cannot afford adequate housing. 12 million who are too poor to engage in common social activities, such as celebrating family birthdays or having a hobby or leisure activity. One in six who have left their heating off when it was too cold, so they saved on energy bills or those who struggle to open bank accounts. I know I approached the time in which I was allocated, but my final point 
is, is worthy, I hope, of listening to. These aren't statistics merely in a vacuum, but from very real experience that I've had in the magistrates and the Crown Courts, I'd like to give you two examples where the experience of a diverse number of people from a jury speaks strongly against the very narrow experience which is had by those in a professional uh, judicial role. And those two examples are the young white defendant who is in a drugs case alleged by police officers to have been seen on a street corner before returning home. He was wearing his outdoor jacket. His account was it was cold in his house and he was wearing his jacket inside and he had spent the day in his house. The prosecution's case was, well, he was obviously wearing his jacket because he'd been out and he'd been caught in the act very much when they knocked on his door. Judicial comment was passed on that as the plausibility of the defendant's account was called into question. He was adamant, the trial was had, and the jury acquitted. A very similar example was for a young defendant, a young black man, who had a large volume of cash, several hundred pounds on his person, as gifts from family for his birthday. I was asked during the PCMH, as it then was, hearing by the judge, Mr. Kumar, are you suggesting seriously that his family gave him money in a card in an envelope for his birthday? A jury rightly acquitted him also. It is these instances that form the mantle around the core of fair treatment and trust that the jury give us today. And they apply through all levels, of all cases of all seriousness. Um, I know I've gone over time, but, but let me thank you for allowing me that extra time, Jeremy. Thank you very much indeed, Sushil. Um, if you did go over time, it was by seconds and, and um, uh, well done. Um, there are many, many questions. So um, ca can I ask our panellists, who've been fantastic on time so far, to keep their responses as short as possible so we can get through them, um, uh, 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 as many of them as possible. Some absolutely superb questions. Um, Cheryl, perhaps a, a brief response to this one from Annie. Can you offer an explanation for why jurors are apparently less racially prejudiced than judges? Does this offer any lessons as to how to address structural racism? Well, um, I think it's very difficult to say juries are less racially prejudiced than judges. I have not done the research and I don't know of the research that demonstrates racial prejudice amongst judges. But perhaps it would be best to simply explain, um, perhaps give an explanation of why juries appear to be, uh, don't appear to be racially prejudiced. Um, part of it is to do with the representative nature of our jury system. It, you know, it's remarkably different from almost every other jury system in the way that it summons jurors and it impanels juries. It is a completely random system. We don't have voir dire, we don't ask juries all sorts of questions, and we don't have peremptory challenges uh, to you know, construct juries according to what prosecution and defense might want. So it, it is a, a completely random selection. And because they are highly representative of their local community, I think that that uh, uh, ensures that a wide range of views are brought to bear uh, in their decision making. And I go back to having 12 jurors. Having that number of jurors uh, means that you are, have a much greater chance of a wider range of views being expressed in deliberations and people having to to tackle those different views and come to a fair decision. Thank you. I mean, it'd be great to be able to pick up on some of those aspects, but, but we can't because we need to move on to other questions. David Wood, who's a member of 25 Bed for Row, has posed a question for Luke. Um, and David Wood says, thank you for your fascinating presentation. Luke, do you think that the increased managerial approach imposed on the criminal division is born of, impl of an implied dislike by those responsible for devising the procedural rules 
of the higher standard of proof? In other words, do they not fancy the high standard of proof? Uh, great question, uh, David. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, how to answer? Well, I would say that the, the higher uh, standard of proof, of course, creates uh, a problem uh, for the prosecution. And it creates a problem for the prosecution at trial uh, and the need to produce uh, persuasive um, evidence. So I would argue that the, an implicit um, aim or objective of this, this managerial approach or, or the system that's uh, imposed by the criminal procedure rules uh, is to encourage early guilty pleas um, in situations where evidence against defendants, against the accused, uh, is, is scant or, or is not forthcoming. Um, and in fact, if, if you look at the criminal procedure rules, there is uh, a duty placed upon uh, judges uh, to inquire uh, at every possible opportunity as to uh, a defendant's uh, plea. And of course, that takes place at the, um, the earliest stages. Now, I think that the, the managerial approach um, has led, uh, use the word dislike. Uh, so uh, I would say that it has led to an, an increased contempt um, for those counsel, uh, those representing defendants who are seeking uh, to uh, safeguard their clients' adversarial uh, protections, and in particular, uh, the protection against uh, pressure uh, on their, their plea. So just very briefly, one, one case that uh, I think is, is very apt in, in, in relation to your question, David, uh, is the case of West. Um, and West is an important case. It, it came a few years ago now, but it, it, it's important because it marked uh, a shift in, in judicial approach. And, and it was an approach uh, which is aligned to governmental interest, in other words, uh, cost savings. Very briefly, I, I won't give a sort of elaborate uh, analysis, but I will say that uh, you, had a, you had a barrister who was involved in the preliminary hearing. Um, there was no obligation on his client uh, to enter a plea, and yet you had a judge who was bolstered by the case management powers under the criminal procedure rules and based his view on the defendant's case um, upon a prosecution-minded summary of the evidence. And through that, uh, placed improper pressure on uh, counsel to revisit uh, his client in, in conference uh, and to revisit his client's indication as to uh, that it was going to be a not guilty plea. So all I would say in closing is that it, it I would agree with the sentiments of your question. Uh, the case uh, I refer to in some sense uh, is evidence of that. Um, and the case is important because it demonstrates how criminal benches seek to express case progression um, obligations against the defence, uh, which are plainly not in their best interest. All right. Thank you very much indeed for that very... Um, clear response. Very briefly, picking up on Luke's reply, um, if I could just pose the following question to you, Sushil and Paul, and just, just short responses. Uh, Penelope Gibbs, who some or many of you may know, does absolutely fantastic work with her organisation Transform Justice, um, has essentially asked whether um, in relation to those in prison on remand who are way past the custody time limit um, and where an attempt to strategically litigate has failed, will such defendants on remand change their plea to guilty in order to resolve their situation and be released earlier? So Sushil, is that a, a, an anxiety you have? Um, certainly current conditions are uh, woeful, if I can be blunt, with prisoners on lockdown for 23 and a half hours a day, being allowed out with perhaps 10 minutes for personal care, 
in 10 to 15 minutes for exercise. It is a concern that I have, um, especially amongst the most vulnerable prisoners who may be having the hardest time inside. It's, it's very easy to look at the practical solutions that are afforded um, and think in terms of eventualities rather than um, in terms of more noble concepts such as justice and whether or not you're innocent. So it's a fear that I have, but I don't have any proof that that is happening. Paul, what's your feeling about the risk of um, people pleading guilty because of delays and so on? Well, Jeremy, like, um, like you, the nature of my practice is such that no matter how long defendants are incarcerated on remand, there isn't a suitable alternative plea they can offer. Uh, most of my cases are murder cases. They're not going to plead to murder and they're not either going to plead to manslaughter or it's not going to be offered. So for me, it's not a problem. The, the defendants are agitated at being kept in custody and make as many bail applications as they can. But I, I don't see any signs of them being tempted to offer a plea. Thank you. Tom, Tom Price has asked a question which perhaps I can put to Cheryl. Um, touches on a topic that has been discussed before, but it's particularly pertinent now. He says that in his recent book, Richard Enriquez puts forward the view that serious fraud trials should be uh, by judge alone or a judge with two assessors. How do the panel view um, the prospect of restricting jury trial in relation to this limited category of cases? I'm just going to ask Cheryl for a view on that so that in the last five minutes we can take one or more further questions. Okay, we've been here before many times, I think, when it comes to fraud trials and getting rid of juries and fraud trials. It, it's, it's, not, it's not a new proposal. It's been around the block a few times. Um, I'll just share my experience. For those of you who may remember the Jubilee Line case, which was a fraud case, which turned out to be the longest uh, criminal trial uh, in, in, in England. Um, and it collapsed prior to... Uh, um, the jury ever going to deliberations and uh, the then Attorney General asked me to uh, to interview the jury and to try and as, as part of the assessment of what went wrong and what I can tell you is after 22 months that jury knew all the facts of that case um, they had a very clear picture in their minds still of you know what the issues were that they had to decide and they were extremely upset at at never getting to uh, decide the case and in effect be, be being blamed for the collapse of the case. So I think, you know, fraud is quite straightforward, um, you know, despite it being called complex fraud. Uh, it, it's, about, it's about honesty and dishonesty and uh, juries have a history of being very good at being able to, to try those cases. Thank you. And um, there's a question from Aaron, uh, Awaka, I hope I pronounce Aaron's surname correctly, which relates to um, sexual offences cases. And perhaps I could just put this to Paul and raises the question of whether um, uh, there's an issue as to jurors holding misconceptions about rape, which have impacted on their decision making. And that there have been calls for jurors to be scrapped in these trials. Is this an opportunity to see whether these cases are better tried by judges who don't, uh, it's suggested, hold these misconceptions? I, I suspect I may know your answer, but what's your feeling about that? Well, it's, it's very often the judges that hold these misconceptions in the directions that they give to juries or the comments that they proffer. Again, Cheryl will know this better than me, but I'm not aware of the research on this issue. It seems to me quintessentially a matter for research. I would be very surprised if the juries held these myths any more or less than judges and magistrates. Uh, I'm sure there are rape myths. Uh, that's a question of education for the judiciary as much as anybody else. And it's a question of education of counsel as well for making bad points in rape trials. But um, I, I will defer to Cheryl as to whether there's any evidence to suggest that juries are more or less prone to these myths than any other form of trial. Thank you, Paul. Cheryl, very briefly, do you have a... Uh, uh, yes, we do. <laughs> um, I've been doing research 
specifically on this issue with uh, juries post-verdict at court for the last uh, two years, 18 months. Um, I've shared some of that, uh, the results of that uh, on uh, Joshua Rosenberg's Law in Action uh, last year, so people can still can get the details of that that way, but the, the long and short of it is that the overwhelming majority of jurors do not believe the standard rape myths and stereotypes. Well, that's um, as, as clear as it could possibly be. I think um, I'm going to have to move to the last question. There are many that haven't been answered, and I know that um, the panellists will be more than happy to answer questions by email, which can be provided. But um, finally, uh, if I may say so, a very uh, interesting question from Dr. Samantha Fairclough, which I'll put to Sushil for his uh, response based on his experience. Do you think that protections to vulnerable witnesses, defendants, would be greater without jury trial, i.e. just judge? That is to say, without um, juries, things are quicker, less people in court, less intimidating, that kind of consideration. So, Sushil, um, a, a quick response on that. Sorry, Jeremy, was that vulnerable witnesses or vulnerable defendants or both? Well, both, but yeah, the vulnerable participants in the process. It's always um, less stressful, one would imagine, um, appearing in a situation in which you're unfamiliar, where there are fewer people in court, fewer new faces, that stands to reason. But I would be very wary about looking for any advantages such as those, when what is at real risk is the underlying fairness of the proceedings as a whole, particularly coming at it from the view of the defendant, as we do at 25 Bedford Road. And so my concern would be, whilst there may be some small advantages, that would be grossly outweighed by the very real risk to justice being done. Thank you very much indeed. All right, well, as I said, that's the last question we have time for. Thank you, everyone, for the many, many questions that are popping up. Um, what I'm going to do before I say some brief thank yous is to have the poll question posed again. Uh, and that question, um, Varun, if you'd like to put it up on the screen, is if inroads to the jury system could guarantee a material speeding up in the listing of custody cases, would you be in favour? So if everyone would like to vote on that at this stage, And in just a few seconds, I will announce the result, both before and after the panelists spoke. The outcome of the poll pre-panelists presentations was 36% yes to the question, which is a not insignificant, uh, which is a significant proportion 64% no, 36% yes, 64% no. Um, I, I hope I'm about to be informed of the result of the post presentation uh, poll. I'll, I'll come back to it in just a moment. In the meantime, can I, uh, yes, I've got the results. I feel like I'm, um, overseeing the Eurovision Song Contest, but I'm, I'm most definitely not, um, nor would I want to. Um, and the outcome of the poll at this stage has gone down to 12% yes, from 36% yes earlier on to 88% no, which is, which is a huge difference. And if I may say so, a, a real compliment to the strength and um, incisiveness of the arguments put forward by our four panelists. In relation to our four panelists, obviously I'd like to say a huge thank you to each and every one of them for taking their time to contribute this evening. Um, I'm sure you, you all agree they did a great job. Uh, not much point in asking you all to clap because we won't be able to hear or to monitor who does or doesn't, but thank you so much to each of you. Um, a massive thank you to Emma Makepeace and Varuna Askelon, um, for whose uh, um, assistance and organization in this very large scale event, we are extremely grateful. 
and um, thank you to all of you delegates. I can't see you, but I can imagine uh, how many of you have attended for giving up your time to attend. No doubt there'll be further proposals to grapple with in the future. In any event, please keep an eye on the 25 Beth Row uh, website for our future webinar events. Um, and uh, good evening to you all and good night to Luke in Hong Kong where it's 1.15 a.m. Good luck and take care and see you all. Thank you very much indeed.